This is episode 18 of Paper Cut for March 29th, 2023. Welcome to season three of Paper Cut, the Nyack Library's podcast. I'm Morgan Strand. I'm Tracy Dunstan. And I'm Rosemary Farrell. And this episode is about women's history and women's stories. When I was thinking about women's history, women's stories, I wanted to focus on ways to tell history through novels and personal stories as opposed to like typical nonfiction histories. So I was, I've been reading a lot of Italian authors recently and I wanted to talk about three of them today, Natalie Ginsburg, uh, Elena Ferrante and Alba de Cespedes. And uh, Ginsburg and Ferrante are pretty well known in the United States. They have a lot of things in uh, a lot of works available in translation and Ferrante's gotten a lot of press in the past few years because of her Neapolitan quartet and it was adapted into an HBO series and another one of her novels, The Lost Daughter, was adapted into a film that was on Netflix that did really well. Um, Alba de Cespedes has sort of been forgotten in um, in the United States and even in Italy a little for a while, where, even though she was pretty popular back in the 50s and 60s. And finally, her books are being reissued. So I just got her latest one, um, The Forbidden Notebook. But anyway, so all three of these women, great writers, they write novels, essays. Uh, they were all very political. Well, Ferrante, not so much, but Ginsburg and Cespedes were both really politically active during their lives. They're no longer alive. Um, Ferrante is. Um, so they have all tell... His, uh, they all tell history, stories of history through personal stories, including novels and memoirs. So Ginsburg, um, Ginsburg is, she's one of the most important modern Italian writers. And like I said, she, her work has uh, been translated and is widely available in English language. And she grew up in, she was born in Sicily, but she grew up in Turin and her family was this very, intellectual, creative, activist family. She was, uh, her father was a Jewish man, her mother was Catholic, which is sort of rare that the Jewish and, G Jewish and Catholic uh, people would get married at that, at that time, although they raised all their kids as atheists. And um, Ginsburg, Natalie, Natalia, sorry, I called her Natalie. Her name is Natalia Ginsburg. Uh, her first husband, Leone Ginsburg, they had three children. They were very involved in the anti-fascist movement uh, before, during and after Mussolini's reign and World War II. They lived underground in Rome during the war, but her husband was eventually caught, arrested and died in prison in 1944 for his work against um, the Nazis and the fascist regime in Italy. And after, after he passed away a few years later, she did end up getting remarried to a diplomat. Um, she was a member of the Italian Communist Party for a while, but then she became an independent and was, a, was elected to the Italian parliament in 1983. And the book that I um, recently read is called Family Lexicon. It's um, one of her most famous books in the United States in particular. She wrote it when she was living in London and she hated London. She, she missed home. So she decided, well, you know, it gives you time you're away from your familiar surroundings, it gives you a different perspective. So she decided to write about her, basically her life, her but starting with childhood and spending a lot of time with the book with her, uh, with her family, uh, writing about her family. And, but it, it's only about 200 pages. Yeah. 200 pages, but she basically tells her whole life story in the 200 pages and examines all like her relationships with her parents and, relationship with her two husbands and her political work, but it's more focused. It's, it's a memoir. She called it, she, it's, it's sold as a novel, but she even said when it came out that anytime when she was writing it, anytime she felt the need to, or the, she felt herself slipping into like the fiction writer's habits, she stopped herself and tore up that bit and tried to get it as close to life as possible. And she even left all the names the same too. But it's full of she has a she has a very dark sense of humor. All her works do, and it's full of that. And there's great conversations, a lot of dialogue. She uses that really effectively um, to bring people alive. 
And it's also obviously a lot about the history of Italy at that time and what she went through as a political activist and what her husband went through. Um, and I highly recommend it. It's it's really, it's once you start reading it, you can just sit down and read the whole thing in one, one big gulp. Um, the Cespedes' book that I've just finished reading called Forbidden Notebook was just published in uh, an English translation about a month ago. She was also a big activist, anti-fascist, uh, feminist they were a woman and uh, she was actually jailed twice during Mussolini's time as a leader of Italy but she she survived um, and her paternal she was Cuban and Italian and her paternal grandfather helped fight for lead Cuba's fight for independence so she comes from that kind of background as well and it's it's an interesting novel it's it's a diary basically of uh, uh, it's written as a diary of um a middle-aged italian housewife in rome valeria cassetti and she's it's like 1950 she buys the book sort of on the on a whim and she's when she starts writing it's uh she starts to realize how basically impoverished her life is as a as a human being like she's been taking care of her two kids she's been taking care of her husband living like a typical lower middle class housewife life <laughs> at that time didn't have you know her freedom was to go shopping or maybe play cards with her friends but she also unlike a lot of her friends she had to have it she has to have a job because they need the money so she has this other life in her office where she feels much more you know fulfilled in control and appreciated. And um, throughout the book, she's she's constantly talking about how she get, should burn the book, like the notebook is ruining her life, but she becomes obsessed with writing. It's like her special secret thing. And she doesn't tell her family that she has this book. She's she's hides it all around their little apartment because she's sure that they would tease her about it or they would read it and make, you know, find out how she really feels. So while she's writing it, it's almost like she's writing herself into life and she can't go back to the way she had felt before she started writing, but at the same time, she can't really break away from her current situation. So even though it's more internal than the um, Ginsburg's books, and you don't really get too much of a sense of what's going on in the greater world because her life, her world is so like physically constrained. Um, you get a real sense of what it's, it's almost like a allegory of what fascism does to a person's brain and person's mind. Like you're constantly doubting yourself. It's like gaslighting almost like she's, she's writing it and she's, you know, she'll, she'll express, you know, her frustration with her children or with her husband and examine like her different relationships, but then she'll undercut herself meaning like, oh, I must, I have to stop doing this. This is wrong. This is ruining everything. Um, and all it is, is bringing up all the things she's been suppressing, but it's this constant push and pull. Um, and then the, the Neapolitan Quartet by Elena Ferrante, which is an HBO series. It's pretty much maybe the best adaptation of a book I've ever watched. And I love these books very a lot. There's four of them. They're following, they just finished the last, the last section was on HBO was the third book. They're doing each, each book is its own contained season. So they're working on the fourth um, book right now. And it's just perfect. It's all Italian, it's shot in Naples where the books are set. It's all Italian actors. It's not a Hollywood kind of vibe at all. Um, all subtitled, of course. And um, it's one of those experiences where like love the books. And when I saw, I was afraid almost to watch the series <laughs> because I was sure I'd be disappointed, but it's almost like they could see how I saw the characters and they were there on the screen. It was, it's really wild. It's so well done. Cause partly cause they can take their time cause it's not a movie. If it was a movie, it'd be just freaking disaster. But, <laughs> um, but the, the, these four novels follow these two women, Lila, Lila and Elena um, from their childhoods, like right after world war two night, like I guess night, probably like 1950 through to the beginning of the 21st century. 
and they both they're best friends growing up together then they fight and they, they separate but they always come back to each other even if even if they're not physically together they're in each other's heads basically um so it's it, it's told from the point of view we're in elena's uh brain the whole time like she, she's the perspective you're with and you really feel like you're walking around inside this person's body like feeling what she feels seeing what she sees and it's it's amazing because it goes back it, it manages to like really um dissect particular kind of long-term female friendships which i don't know if you've had any of those in your life but i have like the people that you know through different stages of your life and how you you know come together and fight and go apart and come back and they know you in a way that no one else does but also bring in a lot of italian history like the you know post-World War II and the fascists still being around and the communist uprising and feminism. And just by following these two women who take very diver they diverge uh, dramatically in what they do with their lives because Elena yeah. ends up getting a scholarship to go to university and Lila, who's also a brilliant person, ends up you know working in a sausage factory and having this completely different uh, poverty stricken life. Uh, but they're still always connected to each other. And um, it's it's extraordinary. It's like once you get into, like I remember when I first started reading the first book, like it took me like 20 pages and then it was sort of like, boom, you're off. And you her, her writing is like, it just propels you through, you know, 50 years of these people's lives. And these books are long too. They're not, <laughs> they're, I mean, they, they, all together, it's gotta be, you know, like, I don't know, 16,000 pages or something like that, if you read all four. Um, but yeah, I've, I just, I've been on this Italian kick, <laughs> basically. Um, and when were they published? The Neapolitan, these past, the, the Ferrante books, they came out, they might have, maybe 10 years ago, the first one came out. Like when I was reading them, I think, she published the first two by the time I found, or maybe, no, I'd probably like read about it somewhere when the first one came out. Cause all of a sudden all, and it, it, all these people were writing about it and how fat, fabulous it was. So I was like reading them as they were coming out, which is an interesting experience too, like having to wait for the next one. Um, and she, it's also a pen name. Like no one knows the real, well, some people say that they figured it out, but no one really knows the real identity of Elena Ferrante. It's her pen name. But for a while, there was this rumor that it was a man. I was like, please, God, no. <laughs> because this it just it's such a genius work of like feminine consciousness and what it means to, to live as a woman. And it, even though it's set in Italy, it's, you know, equally applies growing up in the United States. And I thought, well, part of me thought if it is a man, he's, you know, the greatest writer who ever lived. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a woman. Um, Gin Ginsburg is her, she, she passed away, I think, in the late 80s. But she started publishing in the, when she was very young in the 30s and wrote pretty much for her whole life. Um, the Cespedes, she was sort of like in the 50s and 60s. And then... She published, she was very politically active. She was on the radio. She was, you know, working underground, helping people escape from the fascists. And um, she lived this sort of every like, back then, like scandalous life. Like there are all these rumors about her, you know, her sexual life, her personal life. She lived with a man she wasn't married to. The author picture is just fabulous. Like she's lighting a cigarette you know, with these amazing eyeglasses and her hair is all done. Um, but then she sort of, I don't know exactly when she passed away, but her work just sort of fell out of favor. Oh, no, she died in 97, but she stopped writing well before that, I think. And people sort of, you know, forgot about her for a while. And now these publishing houses are bringing out her stuff in English. And it's just really cool to, to get a sense of how people, women, is, you know, in a country that I, I don't know a lot about. Italian history. I mean, mostly I know it from these books, but uh, how people actually thought and lived at this particular time, especially with all the political 
unrest and uprisings. And it's nice to know, like, you, you know, you always hear history is told by the winners and told by the, you know, there's always these particularly famous people that everyone thinks of, you know, when they think of certain periods of history. And I like to read about the people that don't get on the news and don't get in the history books. And I also like to read novels, so <laughs> this is perfect. Oh, thanks for listening. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I signed up to do this thing called History Day. Um, at, I think it's at Nike High School tomorrow. And like one of the papers is about like how Rosalind, I can't remember the last name, she actually discovered DNA before Watson and, and I can't remember the other guy, but it's just kind of like, yeah, it's like always like it's, they got to the, get the credit for it because they, you know, were the men at the time and, you know, yes. 1940s and, you know, but she actually discovered it. So I always like, like that kind of stuff too. Yeah, definitely. It's like this whole it it makes history so much more interesting too i wish i know there's only so much time in the day but like when i talk to my kids about the history classes at school the like history should be exciting to to learn because it's stories it's yeah. human stories and unfortunately it's unless you have a really talented teacher and some time like very organized talented teacher it's really hard to pull off teaching it that way unfortunately agreed yeah it's like I love history and even sometimes I've had classes where you're just like yeah, yeah. oh man it's like memorize this timeline no <laughs> <laughs> no thank you <laughs> um I don't have as much uh thank you Rosemary you had really yeah. good stuff well I had a lot <laughs> no it was good though <laughs> um I was just trying to think of like women's stories I didn't like and the, only, the one thing that came to my mind really quickly was um the invisible life of Addie LaRue because that was a big book yeah. last year or the year before it was like on book talk and all the different um book discussion groups and I I hated it like the more I think about the book the more I hate it like when I read it the first because I read it for a book club and it's kind of like the plot is very similar to that movie with uh Blake Lively um I can't think of what it's called but the age of Adeline yeah you know, not to make this about movies, I I didn't hate the movie, the idea of the movie. I just yeah. I hate I, Blake Lively is a terrible actress, so <laughs> I, you know she ruined Gossip Girl as well. But I I get where you're going, so yeah, I guess <laughs> yeah. It's like I like I like time travel stuff because it's about this woman who, I mean, I believe in like the 1400s, she gets an offer from the devil. Oh, actually, I'll just see if I have the summary. Um, a young French woman, seventeen fourteen, who makes a bargain with the with the dark that makes her immortal, but curses her to be forgotten by everyone she meets. And it's trying to be like very like, oh well, she's trying to get her own power in the seventeen hundreds. But the way it's presented, it was like she could either get married or join the dark. And it was like I feel like there's a third option in there. <laughs> like she could have maybe just left <laughs> instead of giving her soul to the devil. Um, and then the way it's presented in the book, it's like different vignettes of different time periods but never long enough for the you to really get into like what she does in these time periods it's almost like the author took the gimmick of her time traveling but then didn't even use it because it'd be kind of cool to see like someone time traveling and like because she ends up being a spy in world war ii but it's only two seconds of that she ends up being in the cold war she does like basically everything but you never really get to see any of it and i also just found the character just kind of boring and not really well developed um but the concept, like I said, is really fun. And then a woman's story that I did like, which is a movie, it's Belle. Um, I think it came out in 2014. And it's uh, a woman who's raised by an aristocratic family, a young biracial woman who plays a role in the abolition of slavery in 18th century Britain um, and in this period drama. And I just, I love things that takes history, like we were talking about, like different characters in history and, and makes it the opposite of kind of what you expect. Because I feel like when people think of like Black stories, it's either... The civil rights movement or slavery which is important but i just always think you could there's more we're, we were around in history more times more times than just those two periods so I, I i saw this movie on a whim a couple of years ago and i just i i loved it um and i also really my one of my favorite time periods is the 1700s so it's nice to actually see myself in that time period because like i'll read books about the revolutionary war and it's like you're not even there but so that was kind of cool um and it, what's good about it, it's based on a real person named Dido Elizabeth Bell. There's a famous portrait of her and her cousin. Uh, 
and it's like one of the first representations of like a white woman and a black woman together in a portrait and um she she was born to slavery but her mother her mother was an enslaved black woman her father was a I believe he was a career naval officer and he ended up leaving his money to her and she was raised by his uncle and she ended up having more money than her white cousin and it was kind of the movie does a good job of showing that like at least in Europe, in a British society, it's more about your wealth than about race because she's able to kind of go beyond different bar barriers that would probably be a bigger deal in the United States. So I definitely recommend that movie. Yeah, I remember when it came out because I remember reading an article about maybe it was an interview with the lead actress, but also the um, the portrait that you talk about and how it was tied to the, the story and the film. I'll have to check it out. I need something, something to envelop and distract me. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to my Google search this morning, it's on HBO Max if you have that. Yes, I do. Perfect. So for me, um, I went more for like women's like story of women that are, uh, are important to me. Um, wanted to include a children's one and I somehow always find a way to include Anne of Green Gables. So I'm going to talk about Anne of Green Gables because I love Anne of Green Gables. So Anne of Green Gables um, is a 1908 novel by Canadian author Lucy Maud Montgomery. It's usually housed in children's collections, but it was actually written for all ages. Um, it recounts the adventures of Anne Shirley, who is an 11-year-old orphan girl who is mistakenly sent to Matthew and Marilla Cuthbert. Um, they actually wanted a like a young tween boy to come work at their farm, but they get to the train state. Well, Matthew gets to the train station, and Anne and her red hair are there, and you know. Um, she, the sister originally wanted her to be sent back, but Matthew convinced her to let her stay. Um, and um, they live on Prince Edward Island, so they bring her there. And the novel recounts how they make the most of the mistake of Anne and Anne just becoming the beloved heart of their family and the community, all of her crazy stories. Um, I just love the book. I've always seen myself in Anne. I just... I've always felt like I wasn't just fitting into the, you know, same mold as everyone else. And I don't know, I just see myself in Anne and it, the book just means so much to me. It's actually a series. Um, I will forever love it. I found some fun facts about it. So fun fact, um, since publication, Anne of Green Gables has sold more than 50 million copies and has been translated into 30 languages. Uh, there's also a graphic novel version of the book. There's a film adaption. There's several made-for-TV movies and a Netflix series. Um, what do you guys think of Anna Green Gables? I hope you liked it. <laughs> I love that book. I haven't read it in a long time, but I remember reading it when I was a kid and loving it because I always felt like similarly, like I don't belong here sort of or, you know, Right. Whole square peg in a round hole kind of feeling. And right. obviously she was, you know, a cool girl. <laughs> she did a lot of great things. She had adventures and and was and I haven't watched the the series. I heard what do you think of it? The Netflix series. I like the Netflix series. Some of the I liked the original TV series or um, but there were some in between that have been terrible. But I like the graphic novel. I like the Netflix series. Another thing about the book and the series itself is like it follows her from like being a tween to adulthood and like the different places she goes and all the different things she encounters, love, friendships. Um, it's just really relatable. So I've always I've always been a fan. I I remember lo loving the the original TV series with what Megan Fe Fellows, I think her name is. Yes. Um, and then I wanted to read the book and I bought the book and I started it, but for some reason I never finished it. But I always liked the story. Like I used to just like read the summaries or just find out, cause I like how it goes. I love things that go from someone being a kid all the way through their life, but I've always meant to finish it if I haven't yet. Um, you know, I forgive you, it's fine. Um, you, you know, you better get that done soon. Cause that's ridiculous, but. <laughs> So um, I also wanted to take a little different twist on this uh, topic for this month. So for my second book, I picked Milk and Honey. 
Um, that is a poetry book by Rupi Kaur. I think that's how you say her name. I apologize if it's not. Um, this book of poetry is about the experience of violence, abuse, love, loss, and femininity. The book is divided into four chapters, and each chapter serves a different purpose. Milk and Honey takes you through a journey of the most bitter moments in life and finds sweetness in them because there is sweetness everywhere if you are just willing to look. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, this is hands down one of my favorite poetry books I've read as an adult. It's just, it's amazing. I mean, even the the intro, like the beginning, before you even get to the contents, uh, she says, my heart woke me up crying last night. How can I help? I begged. My heart said, write this book. I was like, I'm done. Take me. Um, <laughs> and, um, so yeah, the book is separated, like I said, into four different parts. Uh, the hurting, the loving, the breaking, and the healing. I loved every different section. Um, I was able to fit my my life experiences into each um, section um unfortunately and it was just so relatable some of the poems you know I I've read the reviews and some of the reviews are really mixed like people either hate it or love it some of the poems are like three lines you know and some are a lot longer some people just think like it's kind of silly I like I said I see where she was going with this. I really love it. I follow her on Instagram. I just think that she's got something to say and she says it very eloquently. Um, and it's just so relatable, I feel like, to anyone. Um, one of the poems that I really loved in the book is, <clears throat> you tell me to quiet down because my feelings make me less beautiful. But I was not made with a fire in my belly so I could be put out. I was not made with a lightness on my tongue so I could be easy to swallow. I was made heavy, half blade and half silk, difficult to forget and not easy for the mind to follow. And I was, when I read that poem, I was like, Women's History Month. This is just, it's just perfect. And I, you know, there were so many, I, we don't have enough time, but I, there's so many poems in here that were so relatable and just fitting. And I just, I just really loved it. Um, yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, I remember buying that book when it came out. And I think, I don't know, if maybe it was you who recommended somebody on the staff made sure I knew about it. But I already heard about her because it was, it was me. It was you. <laughs> yes. You were like, make sure you get this. I'm like, okay, I'm getting it. But I'd, I'd sort of seen just the fact that a poetry book sold as much as it did. And I think some of the poo-pooing of her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the criticism yeah. is partly that it's partly, you know, jealousy that you, she actually sold poetry books and it's very, you know, typically dismissive of uh, not all of the, the criticism, but some of the dismissive of a, a young woman's voice and putting herself out there and talking about what's really important to her. Right. She talked well, about dark stuff she mm -hmm. talked it, it it was heavy it was light it was everything yeah. in between i i think that's another reason people don't like it is because she's talking about like real stuff yeah. and not sugarcoating it and not making it this like lovely romance you know i i appreciated that i needed yeah. that do you know what i don't know anything about her is it do you know how old she is or I think she's in her 30s. Um, I hope I said her name right. Um, oh, she's Canadian. Okay. Like Anne. <laughs> so, so, Canadian theme. <laughs> so uh, she's 30 years old. And apparently my theme today was Canadian, you know, Canadian stories because she is Canadian. Um, I think she has written other books. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yes, she's written several several books wow so yes the 30 year old woman has a lot to say um i'm a fan i guess i'm gonna have to get some of these other books as well yeah anytime anything that gets people to read and especially to read poetry i'm like all for it you know i think it's fantastic right and i don't know i don't know why people 
don't read poetry more. I mean, I read this in one sitting. Mm -hmm. I feel like poetry, novels and verse, if you're looking for a quick read, those are the ways to go. Mm -hmm. And there's so many great novels and verse. Like the, I just, I don't know. They're so underrated. Yeah, so. they are. I mean, I know that here at the Marinette in the teen room, there's a whole section just of novels and verse because kids love them. And especially kids who are reluctant readers, for lack of a better term, or just right. not, they think they're not into reading. They get one of those and uh, right. they love it. Well, look at look at Kwame Alexander's yeah. The Crossover. Yeah. That is such a popular book and it's yeah. novel and verse. I mean, it's now a show on Disney Plus. Uh, shout out to Kwame. Um, <laughs> but like it's... <laughs> It's now a show on Disney Plus. They turned it from a, a book to a graphic novel and now it's a show. I mean, and that I just I don't know. I think they're so underrated. I wish um people would pick them up more. Yeah, it's interesting because I know that like I think it's partly the way poetry is taught traditionally in school. Like or you're it's surrounded by this idea that it's supposed to be difficult or impossible to understand and it's not <laughs> I mean if you have a good teacher it make all the difference but it's it's funny because a lot of kids especially I know myself and my daughter and her friends like girls young women write poetry like that's one of the first that's how they express themselves when they're going start to go through stuff you know when they're entering tweenhood and adolescence and it just seems natural and then somehow a lot of times it just gets choked out of them for various reasons like the but I guess someone looks at it and says oh that's not real like the idea of like what is a poem like it can't be something personal it can't be like something about right. real life which is just nonsense luckily there's there's a lot of great there's always been great poetry published but it seems like like this woman the fact that she sold you know capitalism comes into it like they're like oh people are buying a book of poems so it immediately, they put more money into actually publishing poetry. And there's a lot of wonderful younger, not necessarily even younger, but poets getting published who having books published who necessarily wouldn't necessarily have been able to do that like 10 years ago, five years ago. Yeah, exactly. I, I loved buying poetry books for Nyack because there was so, and so much great stuff out there. And um, from all different background all different perspectives so. good segue into poetry month next month which is nice yeah yeah wow. see i did that on purpose <laughs> <laughs> do we um do we want to talk about programs sure sure so I'm going to just highlight a couple of children's programs and a couple of teen programs um so in april we have a family movie event it is for children ages five and up with their adult caregiver. Uh, we're going to be showing Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway. And um, it's going to be really fun. It's in the community meeting room. We're going to have popcorn. Uh, we just ask that you bring your own water bottle. So again, that's April 4th. And it's 3.30 to 5.15. So I think that's a no school week. Yes, it is. Easter. So it's no school week. Um, we also are having a really cool Earth Day family event. It's called Create with Collage. And this is for children ages five and up with an adult caregiver. That's Saturday, April 15th from two to four. American pop artist and author Michael Albert will be here to talk about his vibrant artwork and will teach us how to create our own eye-catching collage using upcycled cardboard materials. Every participant will go home with their own colorful piece of art. Uh, both of those programs you have to register for. So for the teens, um, we have a really popular manga book club. It meets once a month on Thursdays from four to five, and that's for grades six through 12. Because it's been so popular, I started a new program. It's called Animakes, Craft and Anime Movie. So that's for grades six through eight. Um, it meets... It meets March 30th, April 27th, and May 25th from 4 to 6. And what that is, is you would come in, you watch an anime movie, and while they're watching the movie, they're also going to make a craft and have snacks. So it's a pretty cool way to, you know, keep all of you busy. <laughs> um, we also have on Saturdays from 1 to 2, our teen coloring and drawing social hour. 
So for that one, you don't have to register. You just show up from one to two and color and draw with us while chatting about books that you're reading, shows you're watching, and discuss anything else on your mind. It's been pretty cool because kids of all ages are coming. We're just having like fun conversations. Um, a lot of the homeschool kids are meeting some of the, you know, in-school kids. And it's been really just a lot of fun. Uh, we're having a no school movie day for grades six through eight on April 6th from one to 245. We're actually, I'm really excited. We're actually watching The Princess Bride and I'm excited because I've never seen it. So I'm going to be probably in the front watching it with the tweens. I'm <laughs> we will have snacks. Um, you do need to register. We did it before for the high school kids um, this uh, in March, and we showed a Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So, you know, we're going on like an 80s, 90s vibe, but like, that's okay. The kids like it. Um, <laughs> and again, I get to see movies I've never seen, so I'm excited about that. And um, the last thing that I'll mention is the middle school book club. And that's Tuesdays from four to five. And um, it's April 25th is the next one. And that's the uh, the book Starfish by Lisa Phipps. And um, like I said, grade six to eight, um, Tuesday, April 25th from four to five. And all of the programs I mentioned for the teens and the children you need to register for, except for the teen coloring and drawing social hour bunch of poetry things scheduled for next month check out our, the website uh, nyaclibrary.org on our events calendar you can see all the different um, dates and times we also have uh, different staff members and board trustees their artwork will be up in the library for national library week there also will be library tours given by uh, the friends of the Nyack library uh, different parts of the library that will be i think it's the third week in april and then just for this month, for, uh, for uh, Women's History Month, um, our local history librarian, Kat Sullivan, made an online exhibit about Carolyn Lennox Babcock. She was a suffragette from Nyack. And you can visit that at bit.ly backslash NYK women, W-O-M-E-N. And over at Mamaroneck Public Library in Westchester uh, on April 1st at 2 p.m., we have a local filmmaker, Ryan Camarda is showing his documentary, Royalty Free, the music of Kevin McLeod. And he's gonna answer questions and discuss the creation of the film afterwards. On April 3rd at 6 p.m. in our community meeting room, we have a musical show with Francine Evans and Joel Zelnick performing songs um, from the era of the Rat Pack. It's like Rat Pack 2, the ladies and the gents. Um, and they used to do show, they did the similar show off Broadway. So it should be pretty cool. On Zoom on April 20th, we have a program called American Classics, the architecture of H.H. H. H. Richardson and Stanford White. All these need to, you need to register at mamaronecklibrary.org backslash events. Um, we're also um, creating a, we're doing a poetry program this Sunday with for all ages. And I'm found we're creating a poetry tree that we're gonna have on display at the library with leaves with little poems on them for anyone who wants to um to hang <laughs> hang a poem. Um that's gonna happen obviously in the month of the uh, month of April, but I'm gathering poems right now. But I'm excited about that, it's something I've wanted to do past. And that's it. All right. So our next episode, like last time, we're not sure yet. We're figuring it out. And um, but if you have any ideas and you want to send us an email at info at nyaclibrary.org, so you can suggest something that we could talk about. But um, we hope to be back soon. You can uh, reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Nyack Library, Facebook.com backslash Nyack Library, our website, nyaclibrary.org. We also have a YouTube page. Uh, the name is Nyack Library from Home. And like I said, our email is info at nyacklibrary.org. And you can find uh, Mamaronic Library at mamaroneclibrary.org. We have Facebook and Instagram accounts at Mamaronic Library, backward slash Mamaronic Public Library, and a YouTube channel, also called Mamaronic Library. <laughs> <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> I'm Tracy. I'm Rosemary. I'm Morgan. Thank you for listening to episode 18 of Paper Cut. <laughs>